In our next lesson on signaling from Chapter 10, we want to look at the insulin receptor. The insulin receptor is a type of receptor tyrosine kinase. In a previous lesson, we considered G-protein coupled receptors. This is our second major type of signaling receptor. The name tells us that this receptor actually has enzymatic activity, which is distinct from the G-protein coupled receptors. The name tells us that it is a kinase in that it transfers a phosphoryl group. The fact that it is a tyrosine kinase tells us that the phosphoryl group is transferred to a tyrosine side chain. This is a very common mechanism for hormone response. Most of these receptors are monomers that dimerize once the ligand binds. And as is true for every signaling cascade, it's the binding of the ligand to the receptor that initiates the signal. Let's look at that insulin receptor as an example of this type of receptor. We have a cartoon representation of its structure on the right. As you can see, there are four separate polypeptide chains, four subunits, two alphas and two betas. These refer not to structural elements, but we're just referring to the subunits themselves. As you can see, they're held together by very strong disulfide bonds, covalent bonds. And so they're kind of an exception to that ligand dimerization rule because it's already a dimer. As you can see, we have a dimer of alpha-beta monomers. So the axis of symmetry is right between those two alpha subunits. However, although it's already a dimer, the binding of the ligand does induce a conformational change and that's what will initiate the signal. You'll notice in this figure also that the tyrosine kinase domains are part of those beta subunits. This would be on the intracellular portion of the receptor. Let's look at what happens when that ligand binds. In the figure on the lower right, we have the extracellular portion of the receptor. One of the alpha-beta pairs is in red space filling model, and the other pair is the yellow backbone trace, just to show you how those two monomers are associated within that dimer molecule. As indicated by the black arrows, there are actually two possible insulin binding sites. However, only one insulin molecule will bind per receptor. It simply has an option between two possible binding sites. Once that insulin molecule binds, it pulls these two alpha subunits together. So there's definitely that conformational change. Well, what happens on the intracellular portion? In that case also, the ligand binding induces a conformational change. Those two tyrosine kinase domains that are a part of those beta subunits are brought together. This brings them in close enough proximity that they can phosphorylate each other. In other words, one beta subunit will phosphorylate the other and then vice versa. This is referred to as autophosphorylation because the receptor is phosphorylating itself. Now it is a tyrosine kinase, so it will phosphorylate on tyrosine residues. There are three tyrosine residues within what's referred to as the activation loop, and that's true for each of those two tyrosine kinase domains. Let's see what kind of a conformational change occurs upon phosphorylation. We have a backbone trace of those tyrosine kinase domains on the right of the screen. The light and the dark blue represent those ty tyrosine kinase domains prior to phosphorylation, and the light and the dark green represent the same trace after phosphorylation. As you can see, by comparison in the upper portion of the figure, there's definitely a conformational change that takes place more globally within the domain. But let's look particularly at what's occurring within that activation loop. That's in the dark blue and dark green. Prior to phosphorylation, that dark blue activation loop actually occupies that active site. So in other words, the active site is blocked. The enzyme cannot bind its substrate. Once those tyrosine residues are phosphorylated, that causes the activation loop to flip 
out of the active site. Those phosphoryl groups are too bulky. It can't stay within that area and so it flips out. You can see the three tyrosine residues here. You can see the funnel rings of those tyrosine side chains and the phosphoryl groups are highlighted in orange. So we phosphorylate those three tyrosine residues, the activation loop flips out of the active site, and now the enzyme can bind its substrate and carry out its reaction. So again, in order to activate the enzyme, we have to phosphorylate those tyrosine residues. But in order to do that, those two tyrosine kinase domains have to be brought together, and that will not occur unless the ligand binds the receptor. What happens downstream after we autophosphorylate the receptor? And that's illustrated in the figure at the top of the slide. On the far left, we have the receptor in the absence of ligand. It binds ligand, it autophosphorylates, and now it can interact with what's referred to as an adapter protein, illustrated here in purple. That adapter protein can then interact with a G protein. So in this case, the insulin receptor is interacting with a G protein, but it's indirect, and that's why it's not referred to as a G protein coupled receptor. Part of that has to do with its enzymatic activity, being a tyrosine kinase, and the other has to do with the fact that it's not interacting directly with that G protein, but indirectly through that adapter protein. As illustrated here, it's that phosphorylation that allows it to interact with the adapter protein, otherwise it would be unable to do so. And that adapter protein can thereby bind to the G protein and activate it, converting it from the inactive GDB bound form to the active GTP bound form. This G protein is referred to as RAS. That stands for rat sarcoma. That's how it was first identified. What happens with RAS? Well, RAS is itself a kinase. Remember, that means it phosphorylates a target. In this case, there are transcription factors, and that's illustrated on the far right here. We have an active RAS. It's going to phosphorylate its target and activate it, and that affects protein synthesis, that is, gene expression. Mutations in RAS are associated with tumors because, remember, tumors are essentially uncontrolled cell growth. And those mutations often occur in RAS, and that's actually how it got its name, rat sarcoma. In our next video lesson, we want to examine lipid hormones and see how they exert their effects and see how this differs from the insulin and the G protein coupled receptors we've considered thus far.